Thank you, Hervé. Um, so it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our third uh, speaker in this plenary session. Tom Whittem is a professor at uh, uh, Arizona, uh, Northern Arizona University. Um, he has spent his career uh, understanding and giving us a better understanding of how uh, biotic interactions in riparian zones and how foundational species such as cottonwood uh, support uh, uh, all kinds of species from, from large ungulates like elk to uh, microbes and how the genetics of the, of the plants um, affect the, the interactions and the, the, the quality and the, and the type of interactions. Um, he is working on currently on how climate change interacts with population genetics, and he'll tell you a little bit about that today, and, and the implications for restoration on a very large scale, on a landscape scale. And I think if there's any theme uh, that sort of pervades these plenary talks and Jody's keynote, keynote talk is, is the, the issue of how we can look at uh, organisms at a landscape level across many different disciplines. So uh, without further ado, thank you, Tom. Come on up. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Bruce Orr for inviting me. Um, Today I'd like to talk about uh, conserving riparian habitat and biodiversity in a changing environment uh, and a genetics approach that, that we're using uh, to try to develop solutions to uh, climate change, which is a, a very pressing issue, especially here in the American Southwest where uh, we're undergoing uh, very high rates of uh, climate change uh, among the greatest in uh, North America. And here in this photograph, you see a recent image taken this spring at the Bill Williams National uh, Wildlife Refuge. Uh, this is considered to be one of the most pristine riparian habitats uh, in the Southwest. Uh, and it's a disaster zone because uh, record droughts and uh, lack of surface water flows is resulted here in 85% plus mortality, and it's just continuing. And um, I'm afraid this is going to become the new norm for a lot of the uh, southern edges of our uh, of, of species, like uh, Fremont Cottonwood. If you move into uh, uh, the center of this, you can see how basically the gallery forest is uh, just collapsing. And so what this is is evidence of uh, plants no longer being uh, adapted. Uh, we know that plants are locally adapted, but in a changing environment, what is once locally adapted becomes locally maladapted. And so if you're a purist, you'd say, well, we're only going to restore with local vegetation. But uh, if the environment's changing uh, and you're no longer locally adapted, uh, you really need to go someplace else to find the genotypes and populations that are ge genetically adapted to what the environment is going to become uh, in the future. Um, and this is not just an isolated case. So here we have a photograph taken from uh, the San Felipe Creek and Anza Borrega uh, Desert State Park here in California. And again, you can see um, uh, massive mortality, and this isn't just an issue about saving uh, a foundation species like a cottonwood, this is really um, about saving the community that it supports, which is huge. Uh, in the Bill Williams National Wildlife Refuge, uh, there are 30 sensitive and uh, listed species that are associated with this environment. And so uh, we really need to think much more broadly about the whole community rather than just uh, these foundational species. Okay, so uh, to uh, insert genetics into climate change research, we've been funded by the National Science Foundation to set up a, uh, a major research instrument in terms of an array of uh, field sites. This is the Southwestern's Experimental Garden Array. And this is an array of 
uh, 10 core sites arranged along a steep elevational gradient uh, with about uh, a growing number uh, of satellite sites that complement it. And basically the idea is that you collect species, um, populations, and genotypes, and you reciprocally plant them along an elevational gradient. And especially by planting them at lower elevations uh, where it's hotter and drier, you can challenge them to what the environment will become in the future. And so in that way, you can very experimentally identify which species, which populations, which genotypes uh, will survive in a future climate. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing. Um, and so here's uh, uh, a data set collected from not only the wild, but using common garden studies that looks at uh, Fremont cottonwood. Uh, and Fremont cottonwood isn't really just uh, uh, the same throughout its range by any means. Uh, there's at least three different ecotypes that are genetically differentiated uh, for various regions of the Southwest. And so here we have, oops, here we have the uh, Colorado High Plateau uh, ecotype, the Central California ecotype, and the Sonoran Desert ecotype. Very different habitats. They're locally adapted to those areas. Uh, you would not want to uh, uh, mix stock across uh, those ecotypes, uh, unless the ecotypes themselves actually move, which is actually happening as well. Um, uh, the data for this is through common gardens, and the molecular genetics clearly show that they're highly differentiated. Uh, you could almost certainly call them subspecies, maybe even species. Um, then this looks at modeling efforts uh, uh, with climate change, uh, and uh, we model uh, ecotypes or populations as if they were species. And it's really important to do that because uh, the results you get of modeling the ecotypes and how they're going to shift is very different than if you just looked at the, uh, if you collapse them all into just one species. And so, for example, uh, the California ecotype over the next 50 years uh, is not projected to actually shift much. Uh, but the Utah high uh, uh, plateau ecotype is shifting uh, and, uh, and fragmenting, and so it's an area of concern. And then the biggest shift is going to occur in the Sonoran Desert ecotype, uh, and it's, going to, its distribution is going to move a lot with climate change. So the take-home message here, uh, you need to model, you need to incorporate genetics into your models of climate change. And uh, just as an example of how important that is, uh, here in Dana Akita's paper, um, we can show that uh, genetics-based models are up to 12 times better at predicting ecoregion test points. Uh, and so this just simply compares no genetics models versus genetics. And in each case, uh, you can see that the genetics models are way outperform uh, models that don't include a genetics component. Okay, so uh, now what I'd like to do is shift a little bit and talk about how do you identify uh, the stock for the future? Um, and so uh, basically we're talking assisted migration here. And so basically what you do is you collect populations and genotypes throughout the range and you plant them uh, in uh, common gardens. And so here's a common garden at the highest up near the upper end of the elevational distribution of Fremont Cottonwood, about 1,500 meters, and then here's uh, uh, a low elevation common garden uh, near sea level uh, at the Cibola National Wildlife Refuge, and, and you use the same populations and the same genotypes, and they're reciprocally planted at all of, at all of these sites. And so then the data that you get out of this is uh, something as, well, there's example data set, uh, and basically, uh, if you look at uh, annual net primary productivity is plotted as a function of provenance or mean annual maximum temperature transfer distance. Annual net primary productivity is basically a measure of tree growth and it's also correlated with survival and many other important traits. And so basically, uh, at the lower garden here, uh, 
A transfer distance of zero basically means you've taken a low elevation population and you transferred it to a low elevation garden. Uh, a transfer distance of six and a half degrees centigrade here means that you've taken a high elevation mountain population and transferred it down into the desert. And you can see that the productivity differences are quite great. And this is evidence, at least at the time that these data were uh, collected, uh, that these plants are locally adapted. Uh, the low elevation populations in a low elevation garden way outperform the high elevation populations. Okay, so uh, this is how you, one way you quantify local adaptation. Uh, and then in the high elevation garden, you basically get the same pattern. High elevation trees do better in high elevation sites than low elevation trees. And so, uh, so like right here, you can see at the high elevation garden, uh, you can then, uh, so they're locally adapted. But again, as climate change, everything that's locally adapted is going to become locally maladapted. Okay, so then where do you, you can use this to identify where do you get the stock for the future. And so here we have at our high elevation uh, site, then we can say, okay, if the climate is projected to change three degrees centigrade, well, you just slide down the scale three degrees, and those identify the populations that are already genetically adapted to a three degree increase in temperature. And so that's what you use for restoration. If it changes six degrees centigrade, you simply keep working down the scale and you find the ones that are already genetically adapted to a six degree centigrade increase in temperature. Uh, it's a little more problematic for low elevation sites because where do you go to find something that's already hotter and drier than a low elevation site? Uh, there's a great deal of genetic variation out there which is very much in our favor uh, and you're going to have to look harder. Uh, however, once you exceed the, uh, the physiological limits of the species, then you really have to say, well, we got to give it up here, or we genetically modify it, or uh, we're simply going to an equivalent functional species, which will be tough to do, uh, but uh, that we may be forced into these scenarios. Uh, but anyway, this is a very quantitative way to identify the stocks for the future. Um, another thing that I think is really important that uh, we're finding is that rooting strategies in plants are genetically based. And in cottonwood, uh, it's, a, it's a heritable trait. And so this shows Jackie Parker uh, with one of her uh, rhizotron experiments, and she can show that some genotypes, uh, they, their roots just stay shallow. They do not go down. Other genotypes, however, grow much deeper, much faster, and so we think we can select for trees that have deeper rooting strategies to chase a declining water table. And as more and more rivers shift over from being permanent streams to intermittent or temporary streams, I think this is what we're gonna to have to do if we wanna keep cottonwoods on the landscape. Okay, so uh, here I focus so far on the foundation species of the tree, but keep in mind that these trees support hundreds if not thousands of other species. Uh, and an important thing is that um, many of the traits are genetically defined such that here is a whole suite of traits from spe specific leaf area, phenology, architecture, bark thickness, survival, uh, ontogeny, uh, resistance to disease, water use efficiency. All of these things have a strong genetic component and this all emerges in these common gardens. Uh, and these traits, the combination of all of these traits define the community of organisms that you will find on these trees, such that different trees support different communities and different ecosystem pro uh, processes. And so here are the ecosystem traits that have also been quantified, and all of these have a strong genetic component to them. So if you use certain genotypes in restoration, you, those genotypes will define the communities that you will acquire. Um, and so an example of this, uh, this is some of Zacchaeus Compson's recent work um, in which uh, he collected leaf litter from individual tree genotypes. Uh, he then put it in insect emergence traps in the stream, and then so each uh, emergence trap has a single genotype uh, of leaf litter in it. 
And so then he quantified the, arth the macroinvertebrates that came out of those uh, emergence traps. And basically what he found was there's a strong genetic component that the leaf litter is so different from different tree genotypes that when you put it in a stream, different insect communities will emerge from each of the different tree genotypes. And so each dot represents a different tree genotype, and the farther apart they are in this ordination space, uh, the greater the differences in the communities that will emerge from those genotypes. And so just by knowing the genotype of the tree, he could account for uh, more than 40% of the variation in the uh, macroinvertebrate communities that they would support. So this is really a reason why you need high genetic diversity in a restoration site, because it will affect uh, the aquatic invertebrates as well as the microbes and everything else associated with those trees. So the genetic footprint is really much larger than what you might normally consider. Okay, so if you take this to a higher level and look at all, a lot of different communities, um, uh, including uh, uh, lichens, ectomycorrhizal fungi, soil bacteria, soil fungi, endophytes, arthropods, fungal pathogens, they're all interlinked based upon the underlying genotype of the tree. And so different genotypes of trees will support different communities, but the network of interactions is fundamentally different as well. So all of the lines you see here represent all of the possible combinations and permutations of linkages, but the dark lines are the ones that are significant. And so um, if you change the, the genotype of a tree, uh, you will affect the, uh, the arthropods, but those arthropods also are linked to the ectomycorrhizal fungi, the lichens, the pathogens, uh, and the twig endophytes, directly linked and indirectly linked to the soil fungi and the soil bacteria. And so basically, this is John Muir's 1,000 invisible cords of how everything is really linked together. And what we're finding is everything is linked together far more than we would have previously imagined. And it's all defined by the genetics of the individual trees. And so genetics really matters if you're interested in biodiversity. Uh, and it is unimaginably linked. We need to really understand this far better. Okay, another thing is it affects the uh, community stability. Um, and so this is uh, studies by Art Keith uh, in which stability is how a community changes on an individual genotype from one year to the next year to the next year. And so if it remains the same across all three years, the community is stable. If it changes dramatically from year to year, the community is unstable. And so here's a genotype that supports a relatively unstable community. Here's a genotype that supports a very stable community. And so which genotypes you use in restoration will affect uh, the stability of the community. And you can destabilize a community by using certain genotypes. You can stabilize it by using other genotypes. Okay, so uh, a fundamental uh, problem in assisted migration is uh, if you move plants around, which we need to do just to save them due to climate change, but when you move them around, will they acquire their home communities? Okay, uh, this is the only study that I'm aware of that actually started to go after this, but it's really important. And so, in other words, uh, if you build it, will they come? And so here's a, a site where it was a super fun site, uh, 13 years after restoration, we had a gallery forest, and now we're starting to look at if you build it, will they come? And so <clears throat> here's, in this, in this common garden, uh, we had communities uh, in the garden uh, uh, from trees that were transferred 18 kilometers, so assisted migration here of an 18-kilometer transfer. These are the communities they supported in the wild. These are the communities they supported in the common garden. And they're, they're, they're different, but they're, they're still relatively similar. Here's another block in which we uh, transferred trees eight, uh, 48 kilometers. This is the communities they supported in the wild. Here's what they supported in the garden. Still fairly similar. But then at 90 kilometers, we got a big shift. Uh, at 90 kilometers, this is the community supported, and this is what they supported in the garden. And so if you build it, they will come up to a point. 
and it appears somewhere between 50 and 90 kilometers is the switchover in which they are not acquiring their home communities. Um, this is the only test of this that I know, but we need a lot more tests of this because this is just one example and it could vary from species to species. Okay, so based upon these and a lot of other studies from our group, we've come up with uh, uh, recommendations for uh, uh, Fremont Cottonwood. And so number one, use genetically appropriate stock for future climates. And that means planting the local stock and stock from one degrees, two degrees, and three degrees. So you're planting for the current and the future. Uh, number two, use genetically appropriate stock for each ecoregion. Do not cross those ecoregions unless the ecoregions actually shift in the future. Number three, use genetic stock that survived in tamarix altered soils. They're genetically different. I didn't have time to talk about it, but it's really important. Inoculate with drought tolerant mycorrhizal mutualis. We know the mycorrhizae are really important and they really affect plant performance, so that's important to consider. Plant adjacent to willows that act as nurse plants. Nurse plant associations are really important in riparian systems and you need to incorporate that into a restoration plan. Select for root architecture to reach uh, a deeper water table. I talked about that briefly. Uh, use intact communities that are co-evolved. Gooding willow, coyote willow, cottonwoods, take them from the same site where they have an evolutionary history. Don't mix and match from all over the place because you'll get lower performance. Uh, and lastly, uh, use genotypes that support high biodiversity, or at least a, 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 ma a mix of those. So all of these uh, we have found to be significant. Uh, and so I'd just like to thank uh, a lot of our collaborators. We have a big research group from specializing in microbes, the vertebrates, and molecular genetics, the ecosystem processes. Uh, we've been generously supported by the National Science Foundation, and all of these land managed agencies have provided long-term uh, access to lands for these field trials, uh, and the idea is with them, they want to take what we learn on the field trial and apply it to the restoration of adjacent sites. Uh, and then I'll end with this last slide. Uh, of our, one of our latest areas, uh, projects on the Little Colorado River. It's the most degraded stream I've ever seen. It's virtually 100% uh, exotics. And so we started removing it, uh, the exotics, uh, and restoring using the guidelines that I just talked about. If anybody's interested in how you could apply these guidelines to your system, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Thank you.